Hey, hey guys, good evening. It's Dr. Dalvina, board certified psychiatrist in South Florida. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Therapy Thursday. Yes, yeah. so guys, we have a very special show tonight. Um, I'm so glad that you could join me on the couch. You are joining me for the purge. Some people did not like the term and some loved it. Others have openly questioned the descriptor. What does it mean to purge? Well, it means to rid, to clear, or free yourself of undesirables, to cleanse, to purify. For the last four years, we've been filling up on rotten, despicable, demeaning behaviors exhibited by our fellow Americans. Tonight, I'd like to teach you how to purge yourself of these impurities so you no longer feel as heavy, so that you don't feel stressed, overwhelmed, tapped out. We are purifying our souls and refilling our spiritual energy tonight. The average Black American has far less wealth, is in poor health, and generally has a lower quality of life than their fellow white American. Black Americans have to endure negative beliefs, judgments, or opinions made against them, and oftentimes experience harassment, are treated less favorably because of being Black, and for many of Black Americans, racism is akin to being melanated. Some Black Americans also suffer from a phenomenon called the imposter phenomenon, believing that they are not as intellectually capable as their peers. This can result in anxiety, life dissatisfaction, and many other things. Amongst all of this is the pipeline from schools to prisons that has been created as a modern day slavery. Published studies found that Black people are targeted by police officers more, arrested more, and are given longer sentences. In some studies in some cities, we see that Blacks are five times more likely to die in an encounter with police than whites. In addition, between one third and a half of fatal police encounters involve people with mental health issues and intellectual or physical disabilities. Churches everywhere, on every block. You know, there is no black politics at this moment in time without... I'm talking about a time where black people, especially black men, were being lynched all over the place. A very short period of time, Meg Rivers, Sam Cooke, Malcolm X, came a little later, Lacey Hughes, is killed by the state. Black people don't trust law enforcement for good reason. I want my dad. I'm not getting no car. I want my dad. I want my dad. No. Why are you hitting her? She can't do it. She can't do that. Her hands underneath her. Columbus officer Adam Coy allegedly shot and killed Andre Hill in a friend's garage. A grand jury charging the 19-year police veteran with murder, assault, and dereliction of duty. The same scenes, decades apart. Protests, fury, anger, hurt spilling out across America and around the world. The cause, racism, police brutality, inequality. George Floyd was a 46-year-old father who was stopped by police in Minneapolis on the 25th of May. A white police officer was seen kneeling on Mr. Floyd's neck as he was pinned to the ground. He repeatedly cried, I can't breathe. He was held down for eight minutes and 46 seconds. After six minutes, he stopped moving. George Floyd's death has echoes of many others. Trayvon Martin was shot and killed by a man in Sanford, Florida, as he walked alone one evening. George Zimmerman was eventually charged but found not guilty. The acquittal led to public outrage and the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement. 
18-year-old Michael Brown was fatally shot by police in Ferguson. Eric Garner was choked by a police officer. His dying words were, I can't breathe. And there are more. America has a long, painful history of racism and segregation. Until the 60s, African Americans were made to live separately from white people and didn't have the right to vote. Nowadays, policing in America varies from state to state. In North Carolina, it takes just 16 weeks to become a police officer, half the time it takes to become a licensed barber in the state. Racism and inadequate training in a country awash with guns are a toxic mix. But in America now, the fight for justice, liberty and equality has spread across the world and has become everyone's. What is it you wanted me to reconcile myself to? I was born here almost 60 years ago. I'm not going to live another 60 years. You always told me it takes time. It has taken my father's time, my mother's time, my uncle's time, my brother's and my sister's time. My nieces and my nephews time. How much time do you want for your progress? All right, guys, please help me welcome to the stage attorney Lee Merritt, national civil rights lawyer of the Merritt Law Firm. He was named by the National Bar Association as the nation's top attorney in 2040, the nation's top activist attorney in 2019. CNN has touted him as being one of four top civil rights attorneys. He is the legal director for Grassroots Law and founder of Limitless Resource, a nonprofit organization providing resources for families affected by the deadliest police culture in the modern world. He has called upon for civil rights violations, corporate discrimination, police brutality, and racial violence. He is also a mental health advocate and lover of the brain and my divine brother, as he is a member of Omega Phi Psi fraternity. Hey, Esquire. Doing. How are you holding up? Oh, we're doing we're doing as well as we can be in Dallas that has been overcome by a nice storm, but we're maintaining. Yes, thank you so much for taking the time and coming on. I know that you're challenge there and, and text prayers go out for you guys that you remain safe in this inclement weather. I just have one quick question for you, Esquire, if you don't mind. I'd like to know from you, basically, what are the legal updates regarding police brutality from Black America? It is still very difficult in this nation to hold a police officer accountable. Um, the nation's attention is turned to the case primarily of George Floyd. And I am so proud of people who stand, stood up all over the country to demand justice for, ju for George Floyd. Uh, but if you listen to the Attorney General for the state of Minnesota, uh, Keith Ellis, it is going to be difficult as we approach the trial for the officer who murdered George Floyd and the other officers who participated in that murder. It is going to be difficult under the current state of the law to hold those officers accountable. Um, and so as we prepare for that case, and, we, and, and we've all seen the case of Breonna Taylor play out on the national scene where uh, Attorney General um, and, um, Daniel Cameron has failed to bring charges and the, the grand jury has sort of set up um, a, an additional defense for the family who, who continues to seek justice. Um, there, there's still so much, uh, so much distance to cover. I spoke with the, the mother of Ahmad Arbery today. Uh, I'm the lead attorney for uh, the Ahmad Arbery case. And uh, because of the COVID virus or the coronavirus uh, virus, uh, we still do not have a trial date in that case. Uh, there's, there's still a great distance to cover. Um, I'm optimistic. I believe that, that because of the attention given to these cases of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmad Arbery, in the other cases of this of this era, um, that justice in the form of accountability for the officers who who were involved in those murders 
uh, will be attained. Uh, but in, it, it, as, as it relates to systemic racism, the systemic racism that offers qualified immunity uh, to the officers who participate in these murders, and if I may back up for a moment and discuss what qualified immunity is and other protections offered by the officers, uh, qualified immunity is, a, is an automatic protection for the officers um, involved in each of these cases. It says if they believe that they were doing their job at the time that they committed these really atrocious crimes, then they, they, they should be uh, shielded from civil liability and criminal liability will be hard to come by. Uh, that that we should all sort of re be ready to move on from these cases. Um, right now, when after speaking with the mother of Ahmad Arbery in preparation for the civil case, uh, we're 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 approaching one year to the an anniversary of the murder of Ahmad Arbery on February 23rd of this year. Uh, we're we're preparing to file a civil suit to deal with the um, obstruction to justice that is qualified immunity. We're also waiting for Glynn County and the um, legal apparatus of South Georgia to hold the men, Travis Michael, Gregory McMichael, and William Roddy, uh, Roddy accountable for the murder of Ahmaud Arbery. We still don't have a date set. Um, and so, uh, Dr. Delvita, you asked me to sort of kind of give an update for where we are. Unfortunately, justice has not been guaranteed. I, I can't affirm positively that we'll, we'll be moving forward with a, a trial date for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, or Ahmaud Arbery. And so as your audience prepares to brace themselves for the next step in this fight, know that uh, our legal system has not been set up in such a way as to guarantee accountability in any of these cases. And if we were going to have justice for these cases, we don't even have a trial date set in any of these cases yet. And so wow. there, there's going to be a fight at every level um, before we, we move closer to justice. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for that. that uh, fire. So you said the word optimism. And so optimism for me is the same as saying happy. Before you go, what are a couple of things that you do to maintain your mental health and wellness to remain balanced? Uh, and, and I appreciate you asking me the question, and, and Dr. Delvini, you know, I've, I've tied myself closer uh, to you. Before, for a while, I, th I thought it was uh, sufficient to say that, you know, I'm thinking about mental health and, and, that, and that serving the, having the opportunity to serve each of these families directly is a form of mental health, but that's really just pouring out of the cup. Um, I've learned to be more conscientious and I had to learn the hard way. I ended up in the hospital suffering an anxiety attack right before the November 5th election. Um, um, as, I, as I prepared to head to Georgia and, and encourage black men to vote, um, I, I've learned to be more conscientious about uh, deliberate efforts about my personal mental health. Uh, I make sure that I see my personal therapist once a week. There's still a stigma attached to receiving uh, therapy on a regular yeah. basis, uh, for, particularly for black men, but in general in the black community. Uh, I've, 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 of course, set that aside and I meet regularly, weekly on, on Mondays with, <laughs> with my, my therapist uh, to work out my, mental, uh, my anxiety and mental health issues associated with the trauma of the cases that I work. But I, I really encourage people all over the world to take on um, mental health uh, activities, uh, a, a regimen weekly on a weekly basis, just like we, we consider our, our dietary basis or our, phys our, our working out. We should be uh, regularly checking in on our, our, our mental response to trauma. And so that, that's something that I've been doing on seeing my, uh, seeing my therapist regularly, spending time to slow down, spend time with my children. I've started a garden in my backyard and taking time to uh, 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 appreciate nature. I, 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 I put up a, a bird house and I've been doing a bit of bird watching and just really just slowing down and, and um, um, taking taking time to uh, do nothing. That's that's difficult for me to do, to, to, do, to do less um, and, um, and, and, and sort of uh, slow down the world around me. So that's been my regimen and I'm still adding to it on a daily basis. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. We really appreciate what you're doing. And um, call upon any of us if you ever need. You need us for some brain growth. I will. Thank you so much. All right. Stay safe. All right, guys. So next up, we have a very special woman. We have Ms. Mar Ellis, who is a minister, an advocate and activist from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Philly, y'all, her passion and conviction for God's people propels her to serve marginalized and underprivileged communities. Mar is currently pursuing a law degree at Roger Williams School of Law and will graduate in May of 2021 with her Juris Doctorate degree. Upon graduation, she plans to work in corporate and civil rights law. Mar aims to use her passion and zeal as a voice for change, hope, and healing. Welcome. Hi. Hi, Esquire in the making. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I'm so Absolutely. excited. Yes. So please, you know, I know I just gave an introduction to Mar, but if you would please take a minute or two and fill in the gaps that I left. Tell us who, who is Mar from Philly? So, hey everybody, I'm Mar Ellis. Uh, from Philadelphia, I am a third I will graduate from law school in less than 100 days. Yes, I am counting. Um, uh, basically, I just use my passion, my preaching, and my poetry to reach the lost souls, uh, reach folk that nobody else wants to deal with, to talk about issues that nobody else wants to talk, touch or talk about. Or uh, to, I use my passion to speak truth to power. Um, and, and, and yeah, I'm a minister, a soon-to-be attorney, and uh, um, just here to do God's work. All right. Thank you so much, Mar. And, you know, I heard you on Clubhouse and my gosh, your voice, your passion, your energy just it reached through my phone and grabbed my heart. Like I love people who have a spirit of just um, optimism and, and passion and um, just want to do more in the community. I want you to please share one of your one of your pieces with the audience tonight, please. Absolutely. Um, so this piece that I will be sharing with you all tonight, um, I wrote in anticipation of my upcoming graduation, but I also wanted to honor uh, and bring awareness to what's going on in the country right now. So here we are without further ado. How I keep from going under. It's like a jungle outside. Sometimes I wonder how I keep from going under. Let me tell you about a bland situation that happened at Jefferson Station with my Chuck Taylor's on, Brianna, we won't forget you. A Tatiana, we won't forget you. Nah, Sandra, we won't forget. Let me tell you about a bland situation that happened at Jefferson Station with my Chuck Taylor's on, Brianna, we won't forget you. A Tatiana, we won't forget you. Nah, Sandra, we won't forget. Tragedy and trauma, hurt, pain, and violence. You ever try to focus on your homework with them sirens? You ever have a paper due, but you can't even write it because you're going through a lot, but yet you're suffering in silence? First generation college, and everybody's counting on you to make it so you press forward through the trials, stay up and you study late, you can't afford mistakes, you got nothing to prove, yet everything to gain. See, the field of law was not designed for me, for young black girls who grew up in the hood like me, ones from underfunded schools and violent neighborhoods, the ones who be statistics even though they said you couldn't. I always wanted to be a lawyer. I was so ambitious, but my middle school teacher told me to be more realistic. Now scholarships cover my tuition, so I'm so glad I didn't listen. I'm about to graduate with my Juris Doctorate, my JD. But when cops see me, all they see is JD, juvenile delinquent. Please make it make sense. After the description, please, sir, come again. Officer, there must be a mistake because it wasn't me. I just want to make it to my family in one piece. I don't want no trouble, no drama. I just want peace. But I know my life can end right now with one reach. Whoa, whoa, you don't have to point that weapon at me. A lot of folk will be upset if something happens to me. Right place, wrong time is where I happen to be. That warrant is wrong, I'm telling you, stop grabbing at me. Standard procedure shouldn't be so complicated. You didn't even say why you detained me. I got family waiting and I got graduation. I put my trust in Jesus, I'll never bow to Satan. And I refuse to be a hashtag in the paper. Heart of Shirley Chisholm mixed with Angela Davis. Listen, why are you calling back up? 
What do you mean I'm threatening? I was calm the whole time. It was you who threatened me. What do you mean you see a gun? I told you that I wasn't armed and you already pat me down. So what is this you making up? What do you mean you fear for your life and I'm acting up? Wait, why you press that button? Turn that body camera back on. Let me tell you about a bland situation that happened at Jefferson Station with my Chuck Taylor's on. Brianna, we won't forget you. A Tatiana, we won't forget you. Nah, Sandra, we won't forget. Let me tell you about a bland situation that happened at Jefferson Station with my Chuck Taylor's on. Brianna, we won't forget you. A Tatiana, we won't forget you. Sandra, we will never forget. Now we can never ever forget. It's like a jungle outside. Sometimes I wonder how I keep from going under. Yeah, it's like a jungle outside. Sometimes I wonder how I keep from going under. God bless you. Yes, thank you so much for that, Mar. Anytime. And so I hope you'll stick around with us or watch the show. Thank you again for uh, gracing us with your, your presence and that spoken word. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yes, ma'am. All righty, guys. So now we're transitioning into the panel discussion. I'd like to introduce each of the panelists, starting first with Minister Cheryl Coleman, who's a native of Miami, Florida. She began in the field of dentistry. However, she quickly realized after working and, and through prayer that her life would be more fulfilled in the nursing career. As a result, she entered the nursing profession in 1995. Since that time, she's acquired many certifications. She has elevated her experience, including her education, and has served in various capacities such as staff nurse, charge nurse, nurse director, clinical education director, associate vice president of critical care and emergency services, and most recently, nursing professor. She has a master's of science in nursing that she acquired in 2002, as well as an advanced certification as a registered nurse. In her quest for entrepreneurship, she obtained a master's in business administration. That was in 2011 and is currently working on her doctoral degree from Barry University, her PhD in nursing. Minister Coleman is the founder and the CEO of Abundant Health, Living, and Wellness. Ooh, she is an associate minister and a to the pastor at her church. Welcome, Sarah. Oh, she's my Sarah. Thank, you. Thank you. Next, we have T. Kinsalo Davis, who is a registered mental health counselor intern, who's actually from Tennessee, born and raised, and relocated to South Florida. Consuelo obtained her MA in clinical mental health counseling at Antioch University, has an MBA emphasis in marketing from the University of Phoenix and a BS in psychology. Consuelo's professional identity consists of integrated approaches and multicultural counseling. She has worked as interim director and mental health counselor or therapist at Florida Memorial University, has been an advocate and intake specialist at Sexual, at Sexual Assault Center, has been a mental health practitioner at Tennessee State University, and also a partner advocate for 180 health partners. She has treated individuals, adolescents, youth, couples, and groups dealing with anxiety, depression, co-occurring disorders, PTSD, sexuality, substance abuse, and trauma, and is also on staff here at DRT Behavioral Services Brain Love, and is pursuing her advanced degree, her PhD in marriage and family therapy, or I'm sorry, to become a sexologist. Welcome, Consuelo. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Next up, we have Dr. Kia Everett, Pastor Kia Everett. Dr. Everett is a native of Philadelphia, like the poet we just heard. She completed her bachelor's in criminal justice in 1995 and also furthered her education by attending Abraham Lincoln University in pursuit of her master's of human services degree. She received a master's of science in the field of public service leadership and also has a doctoral degree in Christian counseling. She has 25 plus years of experience in the field of human services and holds a certificate in family life counseling 
and is a licensed behavioral specialist and has covered all areas of substance abuse to children and adolescents with mental health and behavioral changes. She's a licensed minister, pastor, and a bishop. She is the founder of and CEO of Finding Your Way LLC and has created and founded a mental health urgent care center. That's the name of it, which is the first one in the Mid-Atlantic region. She is a proud member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Whew. Welcome to the show, Dr. Everett. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Next up, we have Herdeen Marcier, LCSW licensed clinical social worker. She is a certified grief coach as well and the host of Redefining Grief podcast. Her life calling is to create non judgmental spaces for broken hearts to heal so purposeful living can be restored. Herdeen believes that happiness and sadness exist in a delicate balance. Her dean encourages individuals to understand that life is not perfect, but it must be lived. She's a founder again of Redefining Grief and has built a community of individuals committed to living their best life, anchored down in purposeful living despite what life throws at them. Welcome to Therapy Thursday. Thank you for having me. And last but not least, Miss Alicia Woodall. And y'all, we gotta give her an extra hand clap because she's coming to us from Dallas, which we just heard from Lee Merritt, what's going on down there in Texas. So Queen says, I truly appreciate you being here tonight. Miss Woodall is a licensed professional counselor, a professional speaker and founder of Finding the Foundation, a private counseling practice based in Dallas, Texas. So we got people here from Philly, from Dallas, we have all bases here. Through professional counsel, Alicia assists clients along their journey of discovery and heightened self-awareness, specializing in issues related to self-esteem, emotional management, and behavioral modification. Alicia has provided professional counsel since 2007. Finding the foundation is committed in helping clients dig deeper in an effort to grow stronger. Yay! All right, ladies, so let's get into it. Um, for the folks watching, we do have questions for the panel. And if you also have questions, please post them in the chat. We'll get them here on the live. And at the end of the panel discussion, we will answer your questions. Ms. Davis, I would like to start with you. God is helping on this. What are the mental health hazards of the traumas Black and Brown Americans have been exposed to? And what types of problems can result from these hazards? Oh, okay. So I, I'd like to express or explain that there are different forms of trauma, right? We have acute trauma, there's chronic trauma, and then there's complex trauma. So uh, an, uh, an example of acute trauma is maybe a one-time event, which is what is happening like what um, in um, Houston with the uh, water and freezing of the ice and people losing their homes in that manner, that can be considered an acute one-time event trauma, right? So then we have chronic trauma and that's prolonged exposure, um, repeated exposure to um, distressing events. So that can be um, bullying, child abuse, and, or domestic violence, right? And then we have the complex trauma and that is exposure <laughs> to multiple events. So, and that's where the um, generational, intergenerational trauma may come into play for some. Now, what are some of the um, things that happen in our lives that also manifest these um, um, types of uh, exacerbates the, uh, um, the feelings, the behaviors and things of that nature are health hazards, um, unhappiness and decreased um, enjoyment of life. And right now I I'm going to put out there death we are seeing a great deal of um, our community is suffering where from COVID and a great deal of people are experiencing death in their families. Um, we have um, legal and financial problems, right? Some of that's coming up for people um, due to losing a loss of jobs, um, relationship difficulties, uh, family conflicts, you know, um, and then even work it uh, in the work environment. Um, there's a lot of that going on because people are now conflicted because they have to go back to work and they're not feeling safe in going back to work. So those are some of the um, mental health hazards that can come up for people. 
Thank you so much for that, Consuelo. And now to the clergy. We have a minister and a pastor here, Minister Cheryl Coleman, Pastor Dr. Kia Everett. Um, to the clergy, Minister Coleman, I'd like for you to answer this question first, followed by uh, Pastor Dr. Everett. I've heard Black Americans say that there can't be a God because if there was, Black Americans would not have had to endure the 450 years of slavery, the racism, the discrimination, the lynchings and other hate crimes. What do you say to that? Blessings and thank you, Dr. Delvina, for having me um, a part of this session. And I thank God that I won't be answering this question alone. I have a pastor that's going to come behind me for Iron Sharpens Iron, because these are some tough uh, questions. And these are some very real statements that people uh, probably think or feel based on oppression and injustice. But we serve a God who is powerful and he's mighty. Uh, there are many people who endured uh, oppression and suppression, not just the black people and God delivered those. We saw his chosen people, the Jews, he delivered them out of their oppression. And he did the same thing for us and he'll do it in many other situations. And so God is sovereign and we understand that people uh, may feel a certain way when they see certain things. How can a God allow certain things? Well, everything is not God. Uh, he created this universe and this world for us, but we are people and we have a responsibility in it and so therefore everything is not a God situation it's also a people situation but when we uh, stick to the principles of God God uh, hasn't given us the spirit of fear but of love and of power and of a sound mind there are scriptures that will help us to endure uh, every hardship uh, that we have he's a God that wants to take the anxiety because of the strong man of fear which causes uh, many of the things that we're experiencing in this time and in this season uh, such as the divine uh, oppression, depression, that strong man causes that among us as people. And so again, there are going to be some things that we need, but we have to uh, feed our spirit man and to know that God, he created us. He's sovereign. There's nothing that we can go through that he cannot take us. We can look in his world and see what he did back then. He can do even now. And so uh, I hope that is just a little snippet. I know I don't have a whole lot of time, but I do just want to share that. You asked me about two scriptures. That was one that stood in my mind and the person who was in prison, the apostle Paul, uh, he wrote that scripture uh, for those and to let us know how strong that we need to be in our mindset uh, to endure the hardship and the oppressions in which we should have. Um, and then we can just cast every care upon him because he cares. He's the God that wants to be a blessing to all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Coleman. And so Mike dropped from the minister and now Pastor Everett. So good evening, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Delvino, for this opportunity. And I just would like to um, start by saying, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish. And when we think about that question, um, of course, you know, that is a question that we're asked many times as clergy whenever anything um, bad or tragic happens that affects um, millions of people. And, you know, one thing that we have to always keep in mind <clears throat> is that, you um, from the very beginning, when um, we go back to the garden, all the way back to Genesis, um, when disobedience occurred, sin entered the world. And so before sin, we were um, perfect beings. We were um, beings that did no wrong. But once disobedience occurred, um, the sin entered. And hate and lynchings and all of the things that were mentioned were, are all uh, signs of um, hate. And hate is a sin. And people sin. And that is why we need it. That's why we need Christ. And so when we ask the question, where is God? Um, God allowed his son to go to the cross for our sins. And so because we sin, um, God knew that we were going to sin once sin entered the world. Once we were born into sin, he he allowed um, Jesus Christ to go to the sin. That is the whole purpose that we need Christ. And so, yes, these things occur and they have occurred and they've occurred for years and they still occur. And it's unfortunate and it's heartbreaking. But that is the whole purpose of the cross. The purpose of the cross is to cover our sins and to forgive us of our sins and so that we have a advocate 
Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. He's the advocate for our sins. And that is the reason, um, you know, so when people say, where is God? He, he was there for way before all this happened. And that is why he sent Jesus Christ. Christ was born um, to forgive us for all of this that ha that is occurring today in the land. Okay. Thank you for that. Miss Dallas, Alicia Woodall. What's your people avoid doing when trying to cope? You know, that's a loaded question. I thought about that. Um, they should avoid doing anything that's going to cause self-harm. And I think that varies based on each individual. There's no blanket statement, right? So things we typically we may overindulge, especially when we're emotionally deficit and we feel kind of low, we tend to want to overeat, overspend, overindulge in certain behaviors or habits. And so just being mindful of those things and not overindulging. One of the things I like to remind people, though, is that it's really hard to practice self-care when you're not self-aware. And so that requires you to know yourself well enough to know what should I not do during times of emotional distress? When am I feeling emotional distress? And having a way to know that this is a red flag for me. For example, for me, I love to shop. So if I'm overspending, I need to check that and be aware. Is this about an emotional de deficit or is this because I really need these things? And so each individual has to take kind of their own control over that and know what's best for them and not overindulge in areas that cause them and their families so harm. Okay, thank you so much for that. Let's see, Dr. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hardeen Mercier. <laughs> all right. So we all have felt a sense of loss, grief after hearing of the murders of Ahmaud Arbery. We heard, uh, we heard Lee Merritt mention a little bit about that. And literally watching George Floyd killed on television. This along with other injustices such as little Trayvon Martin. What? can Black Americans do to cope with grief, to cope with these losses? I think they first have to understand what is grief. I, grief is this normal and natural reaction to any loss that we experience. But oftentimes, individuals think we can only grieve when we lose someone. Um, you grieve when there's a political grief that's happening. We saw that with the Capitol. You grieve when there is um, racial tension happening. You grieve when there's a divorce. You grieve when there's financial issues. You grieve when you, lo you lose your normalcy to life with COVID. So we are constantly grieving as human beings because it is a natural process. What is not natural is that we do not understand the powers of embracing our tears so that we can do the release and get to purposeful living. And what keeps us locked up is we do not know. Um, where there is no wisdom, we do not grow. And so I say, get the wisdom that is needed so that you can take control by being informed. Oftentimes, people that look like us are not informed when you're talking about mental health. And so it is my life mission to educate people on the individuals, on their individual process, because it is normal and natural. What is not normal is that you're not informed about it. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, up until this point, do any of the panelists have anything that they would like to add with regard to any of the questions that I've asked so far? I would, I would add loss of faith. We grieve that as well, but it's just that one of those things you tangibly cannot touch. But mm -hmm. oftentimes when I'm dealing with clients, they talk about where is God? And, you know, and one of the things I never do is police anyone's grief. And so I tell them, you ask God, keep asking the questions because he will then, if you allow yourself to be still, he will then provide the answers. But oftentimes they are so caught up in the distraction, in the noise of the grief that they cannot be still to get God's word. Wow. Go ahead, Minister. Yes, thanks. Can I tag team on this amazing sisterhood on tonight? Our dear sister talked about uh, 
really knowledge and knowledge is power. And so I just echo in the word of God, uh, in the book of James, it talks about anybody who lacks wisdom, knowledge, or understanding, let them ask. And the God who loves us all, despite where we are in our situations, he will give freely. So there's no um, question that's too hard for him. There is no circumstance or situation or loss uh, that we can go through that our God does not have the answers for. And so I echo what my sister says, ask in prayer. Prayer is not uh, this whole big theological thing. It's simple conversation and community with God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And everything that you need is found in his word. But again, it's centering yourself, really coming to that place of searching and then uh, listening, receiving, and then <sighs> applying. And I, I, I really like to add, and we just had a discussion around this today. Um, if we begin to kind of look at um, death or the transition as a part of the process, we have, you know, everybody has to go through it, right? Um, and if we, so I agree with uh, Miss Mercier. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm um, incorrectly yeah. pronouncing your name, but um, we have to look at it in a different way. And then we also have to, at some, you know, embrace our people when we're with them. Um, we were thinking of other ways we can embrace each other while we're here, like at our family reunions. If you can go around and say, what is something great I love about you? And, you know, so you kind of like giving your people the roses. So then if these things happen and you're not able to, say goodbye during the transition, you know that you're all, you know, healed in that way. So, yeah. If I could throw this too, to this conversation, then we have to also equip our brains to be able to deal with these tough and difficult times. And a lot of times we're in deficit, even in that sense, rest, water, and sun, three things that are free to all of us. And when we are, when we are in a deficit of any of those things, our brain isn't able to even process some of the stuff that we're having to deal with. So while it's difficult and we have to pray about all of these things, we also have to prepare our minds and our bodies to be able to deal with it. You have to drink adequate amounts of water. If you're a person that you don't drink water, you've got to stop that. Your brain is running on nothing. So water, right, water, <laughs> rest, and sun, those three things alone at least allow you to, to operate at your optimal level. And then from there, you institute all these other tools that we're talking about. But at the bare minimum, water, rest, sun, you have to have those three ingredients. OK, I love those three. I, ingredients. Wanted, I wanted to also just add, you know, a lot of times what I'm finding or, or what I've, I've done, especially being a pastor, um, you know, in, in merging or bridging the gap between mental health and church, um, you know, we focus a lot of times when we're talking about grief is that tangible loss, you know. Um, and when I speak of a tangible loss, I'm talking about, you know, those losses that we can see, per se. You know, somebody had, had a loss due to death, you know, um, and we'll rally around that person because, you know, they lost their parent or they lost a sibling or they lost a child or they lost a, a spouse. Um, but, you know, I'm a big advocate letting people know loss comes in many different ways. And mm -hmm. so, you know, people who have experienced loss, um, loss of a job, especially, you know, when we're talking about COVID, loss of a job, um, people who have had... Um, you know, adverse effects to COVID, who may have lost um, uh, the ability to go back to work because how it affected their bodies. Um, people who were gainfully employed, but because they got sick, now they can't go back to work or whatever the case is. Those are all extreme losses. And, you know, we have a tendency not to rally around those people because those aren't tangible losses so we can't see those losses and to us that's not we don't process that as a major loss um, we only process the losses that we can see death um but those people suffer the same if not if not more because they are actually grieving on a daily basis um the loss the loss and and their losses are actually right in front of their faces um in their relationships, you know, if they get devastating uh, news in their relationships and they're actually grieving, but the person's, person is right there, you know, and so 
all of those losses, we have to um, process and help people go through those cycles just like they do if they've experienced a death. But what I'm finding is we don't do well with those type of losses. We don't we don't process them the same because those aren't tangible losses. Okay. And that's why you guys are here, the experts to discuss and help folks with that. So um, let's switch gears just a little bit. We've seen a lot of social action over the last, I guess, while Trump was in office, you know, a lot of social action was taking place. And especially during his last year, Miss Davis, Consuelo Davis, how does social action help in coping with racial distress? Uh, it's a way for you to channel that energy, right? Um, sometimes we have that anger and I, I call it that righteous anger. That's where we can take that and utilize it in us in a way, in a productive way. Um, so that we can help change things and we might feel like we're not moving the needle, but you are. As long as you putting that energy into the, into it, it's going to come back. Um, and we know that this is ongoing. It's going to be ongoing for a while. Right. We've been in this. Um, we have resiliency. So you can channel it, whether it's um, completing a petition whether it is going to um, uh, participating and calling your local state federal congressman or you know um, it can be you volunteering you know phone banking anything along those lines and what you can do it, you know then technology and being online there's so much there you know people are holding meetings online as well so you can get trained and educated on how on how to integrate activism or be, become a social advocate so there's a great deal out there and there's lots of movements so i encourage everyone to get involved because it takes us to make change happen and justice to get justice dr everett how is the church involved in social action Oops, one second, Dr. Everett. Okay, there we go. The church now um, is becoming more involved, um, one, through the social media aspect of things um, due to COVID. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to um, broaden our knowledge of social media, um, getting young people more involved. We are... Um, being more sensitive, I believe being more sensitive to, you know, with the whole mental health piece of um, becoming more aware and trying to um, make sure that we understand um, that people really are not acting out of their um, humanness per se, but out of an altered state of mind, if you will. That a lot of what people do is more of um, their hurt and their pain. If they were if they were really moving um, from their right state of mind, they wouldn't do all that they do. So we are looking at it from, you know, looking at all of the social things that are going on in the world and it's impacting what what the people that we minister to or that we're charged to help um, from a spiritual standpoint that that's what they're doing. Okay. All right. So back to Texas, Ms. Alicia Woodall, how is psychotherapy helpful for racial distress? You know, it's one of those things to where therapy in general allows you the opportunity to have a, a safe space, to go and decompress, to go and share your truth, to speak your truth in a place to where you're not going to get any pushback or kickback. And I ask people all the time, when was the last time you had an hour of just talking about you? Not a back and forth banter with someone saying, well, me too, this is what happened to me. And you have to kind of share in that experience. Therapy is a space. It's an hour, well, 50 minutes, a clinical hour, for you to talk about what's going on with you. And it's all about you. And that in and of itself, we think about massages. We think about all these different pedicures that you get for an hour, how relaxing that is. And so imagine an opportunity to sit with somebody who's committed to hearing you and allowing you to have a safe space to talk about the things that are causing you distress and to cause you problems and how that can be effective over a period of time, doing that over and over the same way massages help our body start to feel better when we do it consistently. The same way keeping our hair, our hair appointments helps that hair stay healthy because we're going on a consistent basis. 
Same thing. So it's an opportunity to go and just decompress. To talk about everything that's driving you crazy. It's driving you to be upset. I don't want to say crazy. I say that loosely. But everything that's causing you distress, right? Not crazy. Um, but in, in most, we haven't had it. People are 40 years old and have never had an opportunity to just sit and hear themselves speak and get things off their chest. And once they do, those that recognize that find somebody that's really a good dope therapist, man, it's life changing. It is life changing to have that kind of opportunity to do that. And so that's how it helps with the racial distress because there's so many factors going on in our lives, personal and social. And to have that space outside of our home, outside of our friends and family, this person wants to hear me out and they're willing to listen and create strategies to help me cope. So it's a, it's a win-win. I get to let some things off my chest and this professional is then going to help me figure out ways to most effectively move knowing that these are, the, these are my stressors. All right, you saw the ladies on the panel giving you the snaps, the claps and all that. <laughs> Totally. I did, I did. Uh, so much support on this panel. I love it. And I want to stick with you, Alicia. What tools, if you will, should be in every Black American's toolbox, like coping strategies to deal with the lingering effects of racial distress? You mentioned sun. Yeah. Water. So those are my three staples. Everywhere I go, if you ever hear me speak again, I'm going to bring those same three up every single time because they're free and everybody can have them. So that's that sun the rest and the water. Those are our basics. It's the foundational. We're going to have those no matter what. But also in our toolbox support support system. We've, hold up, we've heard the old adage, you know, it takes a village. That is true for us even as adults. Our support system is important. Um, who is there to support you? Who's there to call you? Who's there to recognize when things are a little bit off with you that you can trust and know that their input and their, uh, their observation is valid? So the support system has to be in our toolbox. It doesn't have to be large. It doesn't have to be 20 people. It could be one person. But this is your support system, and you know they're looking out for your best interests. Also, um, again, back to that self-care part, an a decompressed tool. What is that for you as an individual? Is it exercise? Is it writing? Is it sitting and talking? Is it a hobby? Is it knitting? Whatever that is, there's something that you know that when you do this, I'm going to feel a little bit less stressed because I'm doing something I enjoy or something that brings my mood down or back to stable, right? And then lastly is having a safe space. That could be your support system or friend. It could be a space in your house that you know I go here and it's my happy place, period. So when I go there, whether it's with a book or whether it's just to sit and meditate, it is my safe space and nothing in here is full of junk or drama. So again, that's the support system. It's a decompressed tool, whatever that is for you, and then a safe space in your home or in your world somewhere that you can go and you know I can feel safe. And that could also be a therapist session. So I want to add that to the toolbox too. A good therapist. If you don't have a therapist on your Rolodex, your Rolodex is incomplete. If you have a dentist, an OBGYN, a PCP, but you don't have a therapist, it's missing somebody. So Okay. I like that toolbox. I like it. I like it. We got a lot of mic drops going on tonight. All you guys do. Right. <laughs> yes, the impact, man. Um, and to the folks watching and listening, please, if you have questions, please post your questions in the comment section. We are wrapping up the panel discussion and we'll take a few questions at the end. Um, I'm going to Consuelo next. If you could tell me what's in your toolbox, what would you add to the toolbox? Um, I am going to add to the toolbox your breath, mm. your shit, right? This is so powerful and we don't even understand how powerful it is. It is our self healing mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. You take that deep breath in and you set in that, yeah. right? I say marinate in your peace mm -hmm. and exhale that chaos, right? And you do that when you're feeling stressed, you're feeling overwhelmed, um, even when you just say, hey, let me take a breath today so I can be in tune with who I am, right? right? And that in itself is powerful because your breath is healing your body. Mm -hmm. And we keep going and we go and we go and we don't even take time to center ourselves. So I'm going to add that breath to the toolbox. And then I'm going to also add um, some I'm going to be a real therapist right now. Some visualization, right? <laughs> we can't always leave our little space because there's everybody else around. So we have to create that space, right? And with visualization, you can um, create that space by imagining you in some place that you love, that you enjoy, that brings you that peacefulness. And, you know, I'll give you an example, the beach. For me, it could be the beach. You hear, you know, the wind is blowing. 
You can smell that salt in the air from the ocean water. So they'll have someone that you had a great time with. And that can be something that you can utilize. So I'm going to use add those to the toolbox. Okay. Okay. I love it so far. Um, Herdeen, what would you add to the toolbox? Oh, you're on mute, Herdeen. Let's. Uh... Okay. What would you add? I would add three things. But the first thing that I would add is a hammock. Mm -hmm. I go out to my hammock under the trees, relax. I sing, and I swear I sound like Whitney Houston. I will fight you if you tell me otherwise, okay? Um, this is a fighting therapist when you talk about my vocals. Um, and then I would add a wisdom circle. My wisdom circle is so impactful in my life. They're the women that pray with me. They are the women that fight for me when I can't fight for myself. They are the women that stays in the gap for me. Um, they are the women that show up for me sometimes and remind me that my voice in my life have purpose. So get you some women in your wisdom circle that is going to do that thing. And then I will say the last thing is look at your calendar. I have, the, I have had the pleasure and the opportunity to coach people internationally. And the first thing that I do is say, take out your calendar. Because in this season, you're going to learn how to put yourself first. I don't want it in your in your phone. I physically want you to go to Dollar Tree, go to some store, Walmart, Target. I don't care where you go. Get you a calendar and start penciling in yourself first before the husband, before the children, before your job before any titles, you come first. Because what I want you to know is no longer are you going to be serving from an empty cup because the only way people get the best version of you is when you show up with the reservoir and they get the rest. You always keep your cup full, everybody else get the rest. That's my toolbox advice. Okay, all righty. <laughs> I'm loving this toolbox so far. We got so many different ways and, and tools to utilize. I hope you all are listening and taking notes. Minister Coleman, what would you add to the toolbox? Listen, my powerful sisters have kind of almost put it all out there. Every time I show up as a minister of the gospel and the minister of health, I'm absolutely excited that we are marrying the whole of us because we are mind, body, spirit, and soul created that way. And so it's amazing. I met with uh, a couple of ladies before and they're amazing ladies. And we're on a journey that's called Empowered to Love You. And tonight's session was all about the empowered mind. And so I had seven C's and my sisters already committed them out and I just want to go through my little checklist. The first part of that was to commune with the triune God. That's God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Experiencing all of God in your solitude. And my sisters talked about it in different places, whether it's their hammock or their private place that nobody comes into, that community. Uh, consuming the Word of God. The Word of God is powerful, so you've got to also make sure that you're feature, um, washing your mind uh, with the Word of God because that's going to help you to think on the things that are good, that are lovely, that are just report those things that are positive positive thinking if you will my sister said that casting your cares upon the lord that's prayer prayer is powerful it can do what no other power can do and so we must increase our prayer life and being able to talk to god commanding your atmosphere i don't know if one of my sisters said this but there's not only power in what you think but there is power in what you speak and sometimes you have to open your mouth up in the situations in which you are faced with in order for you to have the the balance that you need and create the atmosphere and space. We already talked about positive thinking. We already said you need to consult with your spiritual leaders and the medical professionals. I've heard some medical professionals here. You need both to have a sound mind. The last thing I talked to the ladies about was community fellowship. Iron sharpens iron. Everything that my sister said here, I just echo it. The only thing I think they, I didn't hear was the commanding your atmosphere, speaking uh, to your situation, this power in what you speak. Um, thank you. You see, I'm excited. I just love what's happening here. This is awesome, Dr. Delvina. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
And last, we're going to Pastor Dr. Kia Everett. What is in your toolbox, Pastor? So in my toolbox, um, of course, would be um, the word of God. Um, also, um, the, uh, my sister circle. Got to have my sister circle. Um, also, um, I, I believe in, um, I call it falling off the grid. So um, I just said, I just say, you know, those moments where you can fall off the grid, you know, put that in there because um, it's just so important. And, and what I, what I, what that looks like to me is you just go where you want. You turn off the phone. No, but you, you, I mean, you have one person that you tell where you're going in case something happens, they know where to look for you. Um, but you just do what you want. You go where you want. You turn off the phone um, and you just do you for, for a day or two. And whatever that, whatever you consist of, and you basically are falling off the grid. Nobody can find you. They, you know, whatever. So you put that in your toolbox. And I think everybody, especially those that are, those of us in helping fields, we need that. And you just spoke to someone. You just spoke to their situation. This comment just came across here. Uh, so thank you to all the panelists. I really enjoyed listening to you um, basically witness to us and, and explain to the folks watching and listening how we can cope moving forward. Um, I do have one question that came in from someone. He um, sent this question on yesterday in preparation for today. He states, my question for a possible podcast, um, this podcast, how do parents of color, people of color, excuse me, handle their child's initiation, he has that in quotes, into the painful, emotionally scarring world of prejudice and hate? Any one of you can take that question. How do you basically talk to your children about how to deal with the potential or the possibilities of prejudice and, and hate. I, I can talk on that and I can just go through my grief process of what I teach people. The very first thing is anchoring down in truth. Um, we all know that truth sets you free. So I say start with the truth, but on their level, you know, sitting at the dinner table, not policing their emotions asking them questions and not telling them not to cry, not telling them not to show any emotion, any emotion outside of happiness. Um, I strongly believe we should teach our children the power of their tears. So instead of say, go into your room, instead of saying, um, why are you crying? Instead of making uh, comments that really shuns them of their emotions, I say we empower them by saying, what does the tears represent? <clears throat> and then give them the time to explain themselves in their own terms. Uh, what is happening for us as adults who are not spending time really educating ourselves on emotions. We now have adults that are pacifying their emotions through sex, um, toxic relationships and the list goes on. And so the truth of the matter is if I strongly believe when a mother heals, she heals the next generation. And so it starts with you. It starts with you teaching your children the power of their emotions and stop policing their experiences. Mm, love that. Um, so for me, I, I have actually three, well, two teenagers, um, that are twins and I have a young adult in, in the home and we talk about it op openly. Um, my twins are a girl and a boy and my oldest child is a, is a girl and young lady. And um, we live in an area that is well diverse, but um, is, you know, can be kind of racist at times. And so, we talk about it, um, especially with my son. Um, you know, he's very outgoing, loves to go out. He's um, Everybody loves him. And, you know, when all of the racial profiling um, and all of the cases were hitting, that was, 
you know, a big topic. Um, one of the ways that I addressed it was just to kind of ask them what were their thoughts. What, what, um, because I wanted to know what they were thinking before we got into the conversation. I know what my concerns were. And, you know, I always tried to be that parent that didn't put my fears on the children. Because if, it, and, and I would tell them, if it was up to me, they wouldn't go outside. <laughs> so I opened the conversation by saying, what were your thoughts? What are your concerns? What are you thinking? Um, and that's how the conversation um, would go. So I tried to be open because I already knew what I was coming to the conversation with. So it didn't even matter what what my thoughts were because I already knew what my thoughts were. So I just tried to open the conversation and, and hear what their thoughts were, what their concerns were. And I wanted them to educate me because they are the ones that are out there. They are the ones that are having the conversations in school. They are the ones that are interacting with their peers. They are the ones that are um, learning or not learning in the classrooms. And I found that many of the conversations starting that way were very intriguing. Okay. Um, you know, sitting right at the dining room table, you know, okay. a lot of emotions were flaring, a lot of um, statements were made and you know, it was very enlightening. So I would suggest asking your children to share with you what their concerns are and then taking it from there. Got it. So we didn't have any questions. Um, we had a lot of comments, no questions. So I'm, we're going to wrap it up. I'm gonna ask this one last question because I think this is um, often asked by many people. And I'd like for each of you to answer the question, try to keep your response to one minute or less. What recommendations would you give to someone to dismantle microaggressions encountered in the community? And I know you're like, one minute, huh? <laughs> so what would you recommend to someone? How would you tell them to dismantle or deal with or cope with microaggressions that they may encounter in the community. Let's say it's an adult. Let's make it easy. It's not a child. This is a grown adult that you're you're advising. I think we can answer that because it, it has actually happened for me. I've lived. Uh, this is an experience I've had in corporate America. Um, it, and, and you know, when you experience the microaggressions and you don't know well in the moment, it, it's not pleasant, right? So one of the one of the things that I realized is that if you don't express it, if you don't communicate it, how are you to change it, right? Especially when you're in corporate America. So um, I was afforded the opportunity um, to express myself, and I advocate. I believe that everyone should advocate for yourself anyway in those positions, whether it's going to your HR department. Um, or going to an organization or someone that you trust it, it, within that organization. But what happened for me was that um, I was a part of a women's group within that organization. And so then I was able to go to them and express what exactly happened in that moment because I knew I felt violated very violated right um and i had to process that so so in that um they were very helpful they understood they supported me and in doing that i was able to speak to the president of the organization now this was a, a non-profit organization so it's a different setup it's a different organizational culture however i will always say to anyone, we should not be ingesting or suppressing or repressing these feelings. We have to um, re um, uh, um, release it. And that's a good way to release it, right? And still then you might need to go to therapy uh, or seek out some therapy, right? But however, I do think that's the first step in the process because it, it's going to also make you feel better in the way that you're handling the situation, that you're standing up for yourself, you're advocating for yourself. And that's very important in self-care. Herdeen? You know, I would say you should only confront or address if you feel comfortable in confronting or addressing. Um, cause it can be very triggering. So you want to be careful. For example, um, 
not acknowledging someone or not um, seeing their titles or someone touching your hair um, or, oh, they speak proper. Those types of things you should only address if you feel comfortable in addressing. Like I said earlier, my wisdom circles, there's some things that I don't have to fight. There are some things I don't have to say because they will stand in the gap for me in their strength. Right. And before my wisdom circle, there's always that God that he's going to vindicate me. So I always say, feel comfortable. If you feel comfortable addressing it, address it. If you don't and it's more comfortable for you to go to the father, do that. If it's more comfortable for you to share it with your wisdom circle and somebody uses their strength to advocate for you, then you do that as well. OK. All right. Alicia. Yeah, I, I just I echo much of what Consuelo was saying as far as, you know, living your truth, speaking your truth and being able to say that. And, um, you know, also to the point of her dean that if you're not comfortable finding some way to let that out, whether that be writing it down, talking to your support su support support system. But in one way or the other, I, I definitely encourage you to express and not repress. So when we're having these microaggressions, we have to find a way to let that come out. We're too used to keeping things in, holding them in and becoming pressure cookers in the process. So when you experience these things, it has to come out. If you want to live in your truth, there are ways to say things and to address things without it being controversial or without causing conflict. Just it's speaking your truth and it's letting it be known what you are or are not comfortable with. And I think that's always okay. But again, if you can, if you're not comfortable there yet, def, write it down, but talk to somebody. Do not keep it to yourself is my point. Gotcha. Dr. Everett. So mine is quick and simple. Um, I'm, I've gotten to a place where... I, I just allow the Lord to fight my battles. Um, that's just where I, where, I, where I am. And if it's something that really bothers me, um, I have a service that I will talk to. Um, and I'll, I'll just handle it that way. All righty. Thank you, ma'am. And Minister Coleman. Much of what was said uh, resonates with me when I think of two experiences in which I had. One, I took it to the father. I did not necessarily feel comfortable uh, as Herdeen uh, shared. Uh, in fact, I felt hopeless. Like even if I stood up for myself, it wasn't going to make a difference because coming against a certain system, um, um, me alone was not gonna do it. And, and that uh, was something that when I reflect on, um, if I could have done something different, I would have went ahead and just said it. Um, but, you know, God is amazing. He gives you more than one time to pass the test. And so the second time I took the Consuelo approach, uh, my <laughs> sister, when she said that, and I stood up and I advocated for myself, it didn't necessarily change the outcome uh, from the world's view, but it definitely made me feel better about being able to express. I'm doing, I'm really good at fighting for others, but sometimes we're not good for fighting for ourselves. And so um, that was definitely helpful in my healing process from a very painful experience, again, in corporate America. So um, everything that was said here kind of resonates with me. It just depends on the situation. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. And so guys, that concludes the, the panel. Thank you so much for everyone coming on and sharing your experiences and your own personal knowledge. And um, I really appreciate that you shared a wealth of knowledge with folks. And I think you gave people something to work with. All righty. So um, guys, we gave you a lot to think about. We discussed a lot of things and some of those things um, are included a lot of traumas. So I don't want to send you to bed with the traumatic experiences and recollections of everything we just recalled. Um, I would like to bring on another guest and we're, we're basically wrapping it up, but I'd like to bring on the um, president and CEO of the Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Gordon Eric Knowles. He serves as the fifth sitting president. He's also a master in yoga, guys. So he's a master of many things. He's also a veteran. So Hua, thank you so much for serving 82nd Airborne Division. And um, I wanted you to come on before you, you go into 
the meditation piece. Please share with us, uh, President Knowles, because you're doing a lot in the community also. Um, you just received an award today. Um, you know, you're doing a lot of things to manage and balance. And I know that you are also an advocate of brain love and mental health and wellness. So before you take us into um, about a couple of minutes of meditation and showing folks how to meditate, if you could tell us what are you doing to maintain and manage your mental health and wellness? Well, Dr. Delvina, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, first of all, it's being around people that support you and that you support, you know, it's, it's removing that, um, uh, whether I want to say stagnant or, uh, toxic, uh, anything, uh, that is uh, affecting you adversely from around you. And, and you and I have had this conversation. It doesn't matter whether it's family, because uh, this could be some very toxic, toxic people in your family that is always causing drama, whether it's a relationship, uh, if it's always causing drama, you, you got to remove the toxicity uh, from your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do I do? Um, one of the things, and actually it's, it's interesting, <laughs> a good friend of mine, he says, so you're out there doing your therapy uh, <laughs> in my garden. You know, I'm, I've been into the landscaping pretty much probably all my adult life. I started um, how I got started really in, in landscaping or, or gardening. Um, one of the first houses that I purchased when I was in my 20s Um I landscaped it and then other people asked me to do theirs. And, and actually I had so, uh, quite an interest to the point where I, I thought about going back to school and getting a degree in landscape architecture. But at the time, this was the early eighties, um, late seventies, uh, there were no architectural, um, programs here in South Florida. The only program was at the University of Florida in, in Gainesville. And at the time, I wasn't getting ready to go uh, back to school to Gainesville anyway, to move to Gainesville. Yeah. So anyway, um, I did that and I pursued it and I, I just got into it. So here, here we are in 2021. So when the pandemic hit, um, I had been threatening to start my garden again, a vegetable garden which I had a couple of years ago. And then the hurricane came and knocked down some fences and did all kinds of things. And I hadn't gotten to it. So here we are in the middle of, or the beginning of the pandemic and we're all locked down. Uh, you know, you got to stay at home, et cetera, et cetera. So I started my garden. And so, yeah, that's my therapy going out and weeding um, uh, the weeds from around my collard greens or my kale or my bok choy or my uh, tomatoes or, uh, I got a, quite a few things out there. Yes, sir. Yeah. So that's a great mindful mindfulness exercise, gardening and just being to yourself, enjoying well. your environment. Yeah. And then the other thing I do that I enjoy is that I'm a thrifter. I love thrift shopping and, and finding deals um, out there. And I, I, and I, I've been, when I started the garden, I've been looking for a lot of garden, uh, items that I could put in my yard. So I've been having fun with that for the last few months. Nice. All right. Well, the stage is yours for you to take us through a couple of minutes of meditation. And um, for people watching after President Knowles will bring up Theodore Fisher to play the saxophone, lift every voice and we'll close out. Thank you for coming on, President Knowles. Well, thank you. I, I truly appreciate you and, and, the, and the relationship that we have and the things that we're doing in the community together. Um, and I look forward to continuing that. Well, as uh, Dr. Delvina said, I have uh, been practicing yoga for about, I guess, maybe 10 years. And I got certified to teach almost two years ago. And, you know, yoga is a spiritual journey. Most people look at it as the physical movement that you see. And I, I teach uh, vinyasa yoga as well as uh, yin yoga. And yin is where you're 
you're basically there's not a lot of movement in yin you're finding yourself uh in a particular pose and most of it is done on the mat because you're staying in a particular pose anywhere from two to three minutes or longer so vinyasa is more of a flow and more of a movement and <clears throat> it's really has a lot to do with breathing um we don't think about breathing very much um, because it's something that we do naturally. And when you think about breathing, um, a lot of times when you find yourself stressing or you find yourself agitated, you'll hear someone will say, hey, relax, take your time, take a deep breath, take a deep breath. And we don't do that um, consciously enough. And again, obviously, uh, the only way you're living is the fact that you have a breath. And so to become conscious about your breath is important. So in terms of meditating, um, it's to me, it's about being still as well. Um, in yoga, um, taking that opportunity to be still, you know, when we when we first get on the mat, and we, we go into our um, session, or going through our vinyasa, or, or our flow, uh, a lot of it begins with being still and being quiet and being at peace and releasing and and removing that outside energy from around you and removing all that negativity from around you and coming within yourself. And so um, if uh, if you're so inclined, I would just ask that you close your eyes for a few minutes and just relax and, and, and feel your breath and, and hear your breath. I, I know when I practice, most of the times I do try to close my eyes because the one thing um, I've heard it said, um, um, and I'm trying to remember exactly how it's said, but some of the things that you do in life, um, most a lot of it you do when your eyes is closed because you, you just get that much more connectivity um, to yourself and to your soul. So if you would close your eyes and take in a deep breath, I would say inhale, exhale, <clears throat> take a drink of water. Inhale, exhale, And I want you to think about the ocean. And we use in yoga what we call the ujjayi breath. And you're actually somewhat restricting your breath. And you actually hear um, and you feel that breath coming in and out of your body. And when you're in a yoga studio and you hear those yogis who are practicing, you will hear them breathing. And so you inhale. Exhale, inhale, exhale. Now inhale, and I want you to follow me, take in the breath and I'm going to count and you bring that breath in as I'm counting. Inhale, one, two, three, four, hold it, exhale, four, three, two, one, blow it all out, inhale, deep, exhale, blow it out, Take your arms up over your crown. Bring your arms to your heart center. Inhale. Exhale. So thank you. And let's work on our breath, work on our breathing. You can do it when you're walking, do it when you're working in your garden. But remember to be conscious of your breath and let all that outside minutiae go.
that's my word for tonight. I love it. You just reset my brain. You just reset my brain. After all that discussion about traumas and microaggressions and right. in society, it really does help to reset my brain. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'll see you around. Yes, we will. Say brain love. Brain love. <laughs> All right, guys, so our show is concluding. I'd like to bring on the stage last Mr. Theodore Fisher, who was a freshman in college. He is a saxophonist, I don't know how you say it, a sax player. He is studying architecture and has a minor in music performance at Millikan University. And he is my cousin. Hi, cousin. How you doing, Doug? Thank you for closing us out. Of course, of course. So uh, with it being uh, uh, Black History Month, as you see, I have my Kente, talk, uh, Kente cloth tie and everything. And so um, I thought it would be appropriate seeing all these uh, wonderful Black ladies and everything on the panel um, to play a little a little something from our culture. Um, and I thought it would be appropriate to play the Black National Anthem, um, seeing that there is a lot of strife going on in the world, uh, especially in our country with uh, black and brown and, and other people. So um, with that, here's Lift Every Voice and Sing. All right, awesome music therapy. <laughs> for closing the show with me. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight all over the world. I see some people on from Russia, some Africans who live in, in Russia. So thank you so much for joining me on the couch. And if everyone would just say, brain love. Brain love. <laughs>